Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich im Paulinum der Universität Leipzig zur 38. Gauss-Vorlesung. Ich freue mich sehr, dass es gelungen ist, dieses deutschlandweit bekannte Fest der Mathematik in diesem festlichen Saal ganz ohne Einschränkungen, vorher Glühwein, dann Vorträge, nachher Empfang zu feiern. Die allererste Gauss-Vorlesung fand in Leipzig 2001 statt. Und seitdem ist es durch Deutschland gereist und dieses Jahr ist Gauss zurück in Leipzig. Mein Name ist Laszlo Sekerhidi. Ich bin Professor für angewandte Mathematik hier und am Max-Planck-Institut und ich werde Sie durch diesen Abend führen. Ich freue mich riesig auf unser Programm. Als allererstes möchte ich unsere musikalische Begleitung vorstellen. Das ist das Jazz-Duo Tim Brockelt in Leipzig, eine Institution, denke ich, mit Professor David Tim, Universitätsmusikdirektor und Reiko Brockelt am Saxophon. Vielen Dank. Und nun begrüße ich die Präsidentin der Deutschen Mathematikervereinigung, Frau Prof. Dr. Ilka Agricola aus Marburg. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank für die schöne Einladung nach Leipzig. Man darf hier nichts hinlegen, sonst ändert man was an der Einstellung. Also, Magnificenz, Herr Prorektor Eilers, sehr geehrte Frau Tobis, Dear Professor Lovas, liebe Gäste und Kollegen, es ist mir eine Freude, heute hier in Leipzig zu sein und möchte Sie deswegen recht herzlich willkommen heißen zur Gauss-Vorlesung im sehr schönen Paulinum an einem leider etwas grauen Novembertag, aber das soll unsere Stimmung hier nicht trüben. In der Tat, mit dem Format der Gauss-Vorlesung möchte die DMV zweimal im Jahr an wechselnden Standorten aktuelle Entwicklungen in der Mathematik aufzeigen und sich gut verständlich an eine interessierte Öffentlichkeit wenden. Das ist unser Anspruch und dem kommen wir nach, seit nun gut 20 Jahren hier begonnen in Leipzig. Wie das so ist für solche Anlässe, man recherchiert noch mal kurz in der Historie. Der Sprecher damals war Gerhard Hüsken, einigen von uns gut bekannt. Und natürlich konnte es nicht an diesem Ort sein, denn das Gebäude stand damals noch nicht. Es war in der alten Handelsbörse, habe ich gelernt. Wenn ich Ihnen jetzt Ihre Pointe weggenommen habe, tut es mir leid. So, also, wir sind zurück in Leipzig. Es ist schön, es freut mich sehr. Und ähm, möchte an der Stelle sagen, die Tradition der Gauss-Vorlesung lebt davon, dass es immer wieder den Standort und die Sprecher wechselt. Ähm, durch Zufall ist es tatsächlich so, dass äh, die vorherige auch in Ostdeutschland. Wir waren im Frühjahr in Greifswald gewesen und die nächste Gauss-Vorlesung wird dann in Düsseldorf sein. Zu der möchte ich Sie jetzt schon einladen. Das wird nämlich sein im Juli nächsten Jahres ähm, ja, in Düsseldorf. So, Grußworte sollen kurz sein. Meines wird kurz sein, denn meine Aufgabe ist es lediglich, Sie in den Abend stimmungsvoll hinein zu begleiten und mehr auch nicht. Ich danke Herrn Professor Sekehidi für die wunderbare Arbeit mit seinem Team, die Sie hier geleistet haben bei der Vorbereitung, damit wir dieses Fest der Mathematik hier heute feiern können. Ich danke allen, die gekommen sind zum Zuhören. Die Laudatio auf den Festredner, Herrn Professor Lovas, hören wir später. Deswegen sage ich da einfach jetzt gar nichts und wünsche uns allen einen vergnüglichen Abend. Ich danke Ihnen. Vielen Dank, Frau Agricola, und danke, dass Sie gekommen sind. Äh, nun kommt ein Grußwort von unserem eigenen Prorektor für Exzellenzentwicklung, Forschung und Transfer, Herr Prof. Dr. Karl Jens Eilers. Andersrum, Jens Karl, aber ich höre auf beides. Ja. 
Liebe Frau Professor Agricola, dear Professor Laszlo, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Sehr geehrte Studierende, liebe Kollegen, liebe Gäste von nah und fern, liebe Damen und Herren, es ist der Universitätsleitung eine Freude, Sie hier begrüßen zu können und ich grüße Sie ganz herzlich aus dem Rektorat. Frau Professor Oberfeld kann leider heute nicht da sein, deswegen vertrete ich Sie. Um, 20 Jahre ist es her, dass die Gauss-Vorlesung das letzte Mal in Leipzig war und deswegen freut mich dieses Jubiläum ganz besonders. Und ich habe auch ein bisschen äh, Recherche gemacht und festgestellt, dass äh, die letzte Jahrestagung ihres, Ihrer Vereinigung 1922 in Leipzig war und ich habe mich eben schon beschwert, warum es dieses Jahr in Berlin und nicht in Leipzig war. Und wir sind uns eigentlich einigermaßen einig geworden, dass vielleicht einer der nächsten Jahrestagungen dann vielleicht doch mal wieder in, in Leipzig stattfindet und das Rektorat unterstützt auch gerne. Also es hätte 100 Jahre her sein können, aber wir haben jetzt ein Jubiläum, 20 Jahre und das ist auch schon ein gutes Jubiläum. Und da habe ich mein Jahr zurück, äh, zurückgeblickt und da waren schon mehrere Jubiläen. Das eine war 200 Jahre Deutsche Gesellschaft Naturforscher und Ärzte, die wurde in Leipzig gegründet und hat dann ihre Jahrestagung in Leipzig gemacht. Das andere war 100 Jahre Deutsche Gesellschaft für Unfallchirurgie und die haben auch ihre Jahrestagung in Leipzig gemacht. Und Sie haben jetzt 20 Jahre und das ist ein, eine kleinere Zahl, es muss Sie nicht grämen, als Mathematiker wahrscheinlich sowieso nicht, denn Sie haben diesen beiden anderen Veranstaltungen etwas voraus, ganz genau zwei Dinge voraus. Das eine, die anderen Veranstaltungen war in, im Zoo, eine sehr schöne Location mit wunderschönem Ambiente, äh, beziehungsweise im Anatomie-Hörsaal, auch eine sehr schöne Umgebung, aber Sie sind im Paulinum und schöner geht es nun mal nicht in Leipzig, insbesondere mit der Akustik für die schöne Musik. Und der zweite und das finde ich wichtigere äh, Unterschied zu den beiden anderen Jahrestagungen und Jubiläen war, dass bei den anderen waren sehr viele alte Damen und Herren. Und hier ist das Publikum deutlich jünger und das spricht eigentlich für natürlich den Vortragenden, aber auch für die Attraktivität des Faches. Und entsprechend darf ich Sie nochmal recht herzlich begrüßen und ich wünsche uns auch einen wunderschönen Abend. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, Herr Eilers. Es ist äh, Tradition, dass die äh, Gauss-Vorlesung äh, äh, erstmal mit einem Eröffnungsvortrag anfängt. Und äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass wir dazu äh, Frau Dr. Renate Tobis gewinnen konnten. Frau Tobis studierte in Leipzig Mathematik, aber auch Chemie und Pädagogik und machte ihr Staatsexamen in Mathematik und Chemie. Danach promovierte sie über die Geschichte des Chemieunterrichts und habilitierte über die Geschichte der Mathematik und insbesondere auch über Felix Klein, der bekannt ist für Gründen dieses Mathematischen Instituts in Leipzig. Sie hatte etliche Gastprofessuren, unter anderem in Kaiserslautern, an der TU Braunschweig, der Universität Göttingen und Stuttgart und Linz und zuletzt lehrte sie an der Friedrich-Schiller-Universität Jena. Sie ist bekannt für ihre äh, maßgebende Biografie über Felix Klein und hat aber auch viel zur Geschichte der Mathematik und insbesondere die Rolle der Frauen in der Mathematik und Naturwissenschaften sowohl im Unterricht wie auch im Beruf ähm, geforscht. Sie ist korrespondierendes Mitglied der Académie Internationale d'Histoire des Sciences in Paris und Mitglied der Akta Akademie der Wissenschaften in Christiansand, Norwegen. Und ich freue mich sehr nun auf Ihren Vortrag, Frau Tobis. Vielen Dank für die freundliche Einführung. Bin ich laut genug? Verehrte Anwesende, wir feiern aktuell Felix Kleins 150-jähriges Professorenjubiläum. Anlässlich des 40. malte Max Liebermann dieses Gemälde. Im selben Jahr 1912 wurde Felix Klein mit der berühmten Copley-Medaille geehrt. Dies verbindet ihn mit Gauss, mit seinem wichtigsten Hochschullehrer an der Universität Bonn, Julius Plücker, sowie mit Karl Weierstrass. Felix Klein 
kannte die wissenschaftliche Breite von Gauss und urteilte, es ist die Verbindung der größten Einzelleistung in jedem ergriffenen Gebiet mit größter Vielseitigkeit. Es ist das vollkommene Gleichgewicht zwischen mathematischer Erfindungskraft, Strenge der Durchführung und praktischem Sinn für die Anwendung. Als er erstmals in die USA reiste, wurde er durch seine Schüler auf dem Internationalen Mathematikerkongress in das Zentrum gerückt und sprach von seinem allgemeinen Gauss-Programm. Er sagte, dass in der Vorgängerperiode Lagrange, Laplace, Gauss noch in der Lage waren, alle Zweige der Mathematik und ihre Anwendungen zu bereichern, sprach dann von einer Tendenz der Spezialisierung, hob insbesondere Abel, Jacobi, Galois und Poncelet hervor und sagte dann, dass seit zwei Jahrzehnten, das heißt seit den 1870er Jahren, es wieder möglich geworden sei, verschiedene Gebiete der Mathematik zu verbinden, auf der Basis allgemeiner Konzepte erhob den Funktionsbegriff und den Gruppenbegriff hervor. Beim Gruppenbegriff denken wir an Felix Kleins Erlanger Programm, mit dem er die geometrischen Richtungen systematisierte, die, was Richard Kurand später mit der ordneten Kraft des Periodensystems der Elemente verglich. Klein nutzte auch den Gruppenbegriff, um andere Gebiete zu systematisieren, zu klassifizieren. Er betonte hier einige Beispiele. Ich hebe nur die, die mathematische Theorie der Christographie hervor, die Klein gefördert hatte an, und an die er glaubte, während Christolographen noch bis 1912 darauf warteten. Es musste erst das Experiment von Lauer angeregt gezeigt werden, dass Röntgenstrahlen im Kristallgitter gebeugt werden. Am Ende seiner kurzen Rede sprach Klein von einer Rückkehr zum allgemeinen Gauss-Programm und er meinte damit, die Breite von Gauss kann nur noch erreicht werden durch gemeinsame Anstrengungen und Kooperation und dies international. Als junger Forscher hatte Klein versucht, auch in möglichst vielen Gebieten der Mathematik zu arbeiten, wie er in diesem Brief an Sophos Lee aussprach. Ich erwähne hier schon diesen norwegischen Mathematiker, den Klein als seinen Nachfolger hier in Leipzig etablieren konnte. Das war damals etwas ganz Besonderes. Wenn der Arm von Weierstraß bis nach Sachsen gereicht hätte, hätte er das verhindert, wie die Korrespondenzen zeigen. Circa 20 Jahre später bewunderte Ludwig Boltzmann die Allseitigkeit und Produktivität von Klein. Kleins Arbeiten umfassen fast alle Gebiete der mathematischen Wissenschaften, so Boltzmann. Er wollte ihn neben sich damals an die Universität München ziehen. Klein lehnte das ab, blieb in Göttingen und schickte seinen Doktorschüler Ferdinand Lindemann dorthin, der bekannt durch äh, den, Beweis, den ersten Beweis der Transzendenz von B. Das war also 1892. Und Kleins kreative Ideen waren zu diesem Zeitpunkt noch nicht versiegt. Auch die andere Seite, die er betont hatte, Kooperation konnte Klein relativ früh realisieren, nachdem er äh, Julius Plückers Liniengeometrie vollendet hatte, hatte sich Gaston Dabou an Klein gewandt mit der Bitte, an seinem gerade gegründeten Bouilleton mitzuarbeiten. Klein übernahm das sechs Jahre lang bis 1876. Hier erschien unter anderem auch seine Arbeit zur nicht-euklidischen Geometrie in Übersetzung. Klein war es gelungen, mit Hilfe der Kelleyschen Maßbestimmung 
die Widerspruchsfreiheit, der von Gauss-Lobaczewski-Boyai einerseits und Riemann andererseits ausgearbeiteten nicht-euklidischen Geometrie äh, zu beweisen. Nach Plückers Tod hat er sich klein in die Schule von Alfred Klepsch integriert und blieb mit den Klepsch-Schülern äh, zeitlebens in guter Verbindung, förderte auch äh, Emmy Noether später. Und ebenfalls mit den äh, mit Klepsch befreundeten ausländischen Kollegen äh, <coughs> Kelly, Sylvester, Camille Jordan, Cremona, Zeuthen etc. Es war Klepsch, der Klein nach Erlangen empfahl, als er gerade mal 23 Jahre alt war und er sollte in die Gelegenheit kommen, die älteren äh, Klepsch-Schüler zu fördern. Das Programm Zusammenführen von Gebieten und Personen ging von Klepsch aus und Klein setzte dies fort. In Erlangen hatte er, gab es insgesamt nur sehr wenige Studenten. Es geling, gelang ihm aber auch schon hier, sechs zur Promotion und einen zur Habilitation zu führen. Und auch Sophos Lee sandte ihm schon Studenten nach Erlangen mit der Bitte, sie zu fördern. Fördern unter Klein hieß, sie zu eigener Kreativität anzuregen. Das hätten sie in Berlin nicht erwarten können, denn dort herrschte die Ansicht, die Kronecker wie folgt ausdrückte, wir wollen und brauchen keine Schule. Wir können nichts Förderliches von einer gemeinsamen Arbeit erwarten. Klein wechselte nach drei Jahren äh, an das Polytechnikum, seit 1877 Technische Hochschule, nach München. Äh, er konnte hier in der ersten Vorlesung analytische Geometrie mehr als 200 Studenten haben und äh, real, organisierte äh, das Lehrprogramm konnte ein eigenes mathematisches Institut erhalten und erstmals einen mathematischen Assistenten aus dem Staatshaushalt finanziert. Und er kreierte neue Arten von Kooperationen, unter anderem auch mit Ingenieurwissenschaftlern, von denen er unter anderem die geometrischen Disziplinen der Maschinentechnik kennen und schätzen lernte und später in die universitäre Lehre integrierte. Aber hier gab es kein Promotionsrecht. Das heißt, Klein und auch Alexander Brill mussten ihre Doktorkandidaten immer an die Universität München geben, wo die Ordinarien Bauer und Seidel Kleins Schüler immer sehr argwenisch beäugten, selbst übrigens von 1875 bis 1979 nicht einen einzigen Promotionskandidaten hatten. Deshalb war Klein sehr interessiert, wieder an eine Universität zu kommen. Die Leipziger kannten ihn gut durch sein Engagement bei den mathematischen Annalen, aber hier musste er erst mal auf Institut und Assistent verzichten, um die Position zu erhalten. Aber es dauerte nicht lange, am Dritt, mit dem dritten Semester hatte er den Assistenten durchgesetzt und auch Elemente seines Instituts etabliert. Ich erwähne, hebe jetzt hier nur hervor, dass hierher auch die ersten Studenten aus Frankreich, Großbritannien, den USA kamen. In München gab es schon Italiener und auch Osteuropäer. Ich zeige Ihnen den Belegbogen von Kleins erster Vorlesung hier in Leipzig, Funktion, Theorie in geometrischer Behandlungsweise. Die Unterstrichenen konnten dank Klein Karrieren erreichen und ich hebe jetzt nur die Ausländer hervor. Der erste Amerikaner Stringham schrieb begeistert an seine Heimatuniversität nach Baltimore, wo Silvester noch den Lehrstuhl innehatte. Als er zurücktrat, 1883, wurde dieser Lehrstuhl Felix Klein angeboten, der ihn dann nicht annahm. Der erste Franzose war von Dabou zu Klein geschickt worden, 
klein mit der Bitte, ihn äh, zu kreativer eigener Arbeit anzuregen. Das gelang klein. Äh, Brunel konnte die erste Arbeit in den mathematischen Annalen publizieren und Klein bereitete ihn zudem vor, Poincaré seine eigenen Arbeiten zu erklären. Klein wünschte Kooperation, nicht Wettstreit. Ich hebe noch einen besonderen äh, Schüler, Dr. Schüler von Klein hervor, mit Blick auf den Herrn Prorektor. Äh, Wilhelm Lochay, den Klein später äh, in die Versicherungsmathematik lenkte, äh, sagte, bezeichnete Otto Fischer als besonders betreffendes Beispiel, wie Klein es mit seiner scharfen Erkenntnis für menschliche Begabung immer verstanden hat, jeden in die ihm gemäß liegende Richtung zu lenken. Die mathematischen Methoden der Bewegungsphysiologie sind noch in einer jüngeren Arbeit, Sie sehen das unten, von zwei niederländischen Forschern analysiert und positiv beurteilt worden. In Leipzig hat Klein begonnen, seine, es gab eine enge Zusammenarbeit mit dem Teubner Verlag, seine eigenen Arbeiten in Büchern zusammenzufassen. Die ersten beiden Bücher schrieb er noch selbst, für die anderen suchte und fand er Mitarbeiter. Und ich möchte noch betonen, dass er auch auf seine Initiative zurückgeht, dass die Werke von Möbius und von Krassmann als Projekte der Sächsischen Gesellschaft der Wissenschaften seit 1919 Akademie in Angriff genommen wurden. Ich gehe jetzt nur etwas auf das erste Buch ein, aus zwei Gründen. Hier beschrieb er erstmals das, was wir heute als kleinsche Flasche kennen. Er benutzte ein umgestülptes Stück Kautschuchschlauches, um diese unberandete Doppelfläche zu erklären. Und der zweite Grund, warum ich das hervorhebe, ist, dass sich eine Frau, eine Britin, übrigens eine Enkelin des großen Astronomen John Herschel, an Felix Klein gewandt hatte, ob, er diese, diese, ob sie diese kleine Schrift übersetzen dürfe. Sie übersetzte, Klein stimmte zu und publizierte diese Schrift selbst in Cambridge. Es war das Jahr 1893, als Klein erstmals in den USA gewesen war und von dort brachte er auch seine erste amerikanische Studentin mit, die er zur Doktorwürde führte, Mary F. Winston. Außerdem waren hier in diesem Seminar, was sehr international zusammengesetzt war, Grace Emily Chitholm, eine Engländerin, die er zur Doktorwürde führte, außerdem Woods und Snyder, die ebenfalls unter Kleinen promovierten. Der Ungar Beke war schon sehr gut vorgebildet und hat mehrere Arbeiten in den mathematischen Annalen publiziert und später hat er mit Felix Klein eng in der Internationalen Mathematischen Unterrichtskommission zusammengearbeitet. Ich möchte noch den Italiener Gino Fano hervorheben, der auch Seminarmitglied war, der Felix Kleins Erlanger Programm schon übersetzt hatte und an, später an weiteren Projekten, auch an der Enzyklopädie, beteiligt war. Und ich vergleiche noch mit Gauss, es ist hervorhebenswert, dass auch Gauss schon mathematische Leistungen einer Frau, einer Sophie Germain, einer Französin, also dass Gauss sie hochgeschätzt hat. Sie hatte sich zunächst unter männlichem Pseudonym an Gauss gewandt und nachdem Gauss erfahren hatte, dass es eine Frau ist, hat er an der Universität Göttingen ein Ehrendiplom für sie beantragt. Wir blicken noch in ein anderes Seminar, das Klein hier in Leipzig gehalten hat, wo ein anderer ungarischer Mathematiker mehrere Vorträge hielt. Klein setzte als Ziel, neuere Arbeiten zur geometrischen und zur arithmetischen Behandlung der Funktionentheorie zu analysieren und vergleichen zu lassen, wobei er Riemanns Resultate, über die er ja hier ausführlich gesprochen hatte, was im Lesezimmer zur Verfügung stand, als bekannt voraus 
setzte. Hier ist das Programm. Und ich betone jetzt nur das Rausnitz, wie er damals sich noch nannte. Klein hatte dessen Talent sofort erkannt und gesehen, dass er zahlentheoretisch schon sehr gut vorgebildet war, sodass Klein ihm mehrere äh, schwierige Arbeiten zur Analyse hier für dieses Forschungsseminar übergab. Ich hebe jetzt nur hervor, äh, dass Radosch und Klein darin übereinstimmten, äh, dass für die mathematische Forschung alle äh, zu Gebote stehenden Hilfsmittel zu benutzen seien und keine Beschränkung, wie das Kronecker forderte, sinnvoll sei. Sie sehen hier die erste Seite aus dem ersten Vortrag von Radosch, seine Handschrift. Und 20 Jahre später, als die Ungarische Akademie der Wissenschaften beschloss, einen Janosch speuer preis zu kreieren, wurden Dabu und Klein in das Preiskomitee gebeten. Ich habe die Korrespondenz von Dabu und Klein analysiert und wir können da feststellen, dass sie beide darin übereinstimmen, dass der erste Preisträger Poincaré sein soll und als nach weiteren fünf Jahren der Preis vergeben wurde, dass das dann Hilbert sein soll. Die Leipziger Antrittsrede habe ich erst an diese Stelle gesetzt, weil Klein hier ausgehend von seinem Münchner Polytechnikum erfahren, insbesondere die Anwendungen betont hat, bis hin zu Anwendungen in der modernen Technik. Das konnte er in Leipzig nicht voll realisieren, sondern erst in Göttingen, nachdem Hermann Amandus Schwarz 1892 auf den Weierstraß Lehrstuhl nach Berlin gewechselt war. Max Born, der Anfang der 20er Jahre auch noch mit Unterstützung von Klein nach Göttingen kam, urteilte, Seit Gauss und Weber ist es eine Göttinger Tradition, dass Mathematik und Physik nicht nebeneinander, sondern miteinander fortschreiten. Klein hat diese Tradition besonders energisch gehütet und durch Einbeziehung der technischen Wissenschaften ausgebaut. Das heißt, er konnte tatsächlich die Breite von Gauss und auch noch neuere Gebiete wie etwa physikalische Chemie hier in Göttingen etablieren, Hilbert, der schon ein Semester bei Klein studiert hatte, hatte Klein immer weiter verfolgt sie, äh, und hat schon an das preußische Kultusministerium 1890 dann geschrieben, Hilbert is, das hat er in Englisch geschrieben, Hilbert is the rising man, weil er gerade eine Gastprofessur in die USA erhalten hatte, was er dann nicht annehmen sollte, das ist, würde jetzt zu weit führen. Also, warum konnte er das erreichen? weil er eine neue Art der Finanzierung gefunden hatte, nach dem Beispiel der USA, aber auch nach dem Beispiel der Carl Zeiss Stiftung, die Ernst Appe in Jena schon 1889 etabliert hatte. Klein fand 50 an Wissenschaft interessierte finanzkräftige Personen, die Geld gaben, um angewandte Physik und Mathematik zu fördern. Wir kommen nochmal auf Klein und Gauss speziell zurück. Der andere Widersacher von äh, Klein, Ernst Schering, war 1897 gestorben, hatte die Gauss-Edition geleitet, die lag ziemlich da nieder. Klein hat das sofort übernommen und neue Mitarbeiter gesucht und gefunden und hat selbst noch das wissenschaftliche Tagebuch von Gauss in Latein geschrieben, ediert, kommentiert. <lacht> Nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg hat er fortgesetzt auf die, mit, der Gauss, äh, mit den Gaussarbeiten und hat noch neue Mitarbeiter gesucht, unter anderem Frenkel, der zu Zahlbegriff und Algebra bei Gauss arbeitete. Und Frenkel hat in seiner Autobiografie hinterlassen, dass er Klein noch, der war ja seit, hatte sich äh, 1913 äh, vorzeitig emeritieren lassen, äh, als Außenminister der Mathematik in Deutschland erlebte. Außenminister der Mathematik war Klein auch für die Reform des Mathematikunterrichts. Vom Kindergarten bis zur Universität. Das sind Worte von Klein, 
die er in einer Rede als parteiloser Repräsentant der Universität Göttingen in der ersten Kammer des Preußischen Landtages hielt. Er konnte auch hierfür nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg noch die Reformergebnisse sichern. Das aber, und das ist meist wenig bekannt, er konnte auch für die Forschung wichtige mathematische Projekte sichern. Er hat nämlich noch das Angebot angenommen, erster Vorsitzender des Fachausschusses der Deutschen Forschungsgemeinschaft zu sein, die 1920 als Notgemeinschaft der deutschen Wissenschaft gegründet worden war. Fritz Haber ist Vorstandsmitglied bei der Notgemeinschaft gewesen. Nach dem Kleinen verstorben war, hat die Deutsche Mathematikervereinigung beschlossen, eine Gedenktafel am Geburtshaus von Felix Klein anzubringen. Die Festansprache hielt Otto Blumenthal, der erste Doktorschüler von Hilbert in Göttingen. Darin lesen wir unter anderem, wer im Gedächtnis der großen Welt leben soll, muss auf die große Welt gewirkt haben. Danke.
darf ich unseren Sprecher äh, vorstellen, Professor Dr. Laszlo Lovas. Professor Lovas promovierte 1971 an der Oetwurst-Lorand Universität in Budapest. Er war an zahlreichen Universitäten der Welt tätig, unter anderem in den 90er Jahren in Yale, später bei Microsoft Research in Seattle, bevor er an seine Alma Mater 2006 nach Budapest zurückkehrte. Er ist Mitglied der Ungarischen Akademie der Wissenschaften, auch der ähm, Leopoldina in Halle und viele andere Akademien der, der Welt. Er war 2007 bis 2010 Präsident der Internationalen Mathematischen Union und 2014 bis 2020 äh, Präsident der Ungarischen äh, Akademie der Wissenschaften. Und was für mich unbegreiflich ist, er hat in dieser Zeit weiterhin sehr intensive Forschung betrieben und äh, unter anderem über den Übergang von diskreter, stetiger Mathematik im Kontext der Graphentheorie und hat auch mehrere Bücher geschrieben in dieser, in dieser Zeit als, als Präsident. Er wurde mit äh, vielen namhaften Preisen ausgezeichnet, unter anderem dem Wolf Prize aus Israel, dem Kyoto Prize aus äh, Japan und äh, letztes Jahr mit dem Abel Prize. Gewiss, gewissermaßen sind alle diese Preise Ersatz für den Nobelpreis in der Mathematik. Er ist vor allem für seine Arbeiten auf dem Gebiet der Kombinatorik und Graphentheorie weltweit bekannt, unter anderem für das LLL-Algorithmus. Sie sehen, es gibt drei Ls in seinem Namen, aber nur eins steht für Lovas, die anderen zwei für Lenstra. Das ist ein Algorithmus, das für die Kryptographie wichtig ist, aber wurde auch für in der Riemannschen Vermutung angewendet. Und ja, I'm very happy and honored to welcome Professor Dr. Laszlo Lovas. Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, most sincerely for this honor of uh, being able to give this talk today to you in this uh, very beautiful and also very interesting uh, uh, hall. I, uh, uh, I really uh, have had great chats, great uh, interactions over the last few days and before with uh, several of you. So I really like uh, this, um, and I'm really very pleased to be able to, to give this talk. So uh, sort of the earliest issue about uh, the, whether the word is discrete or continuous Uh, probably can be thought of as the Zeno's paradox about Achilles and the turtle. And it's well known that the paradox says that Achilles is ten times, say, ten times as fast as the turtle, but the turtle has a head start of, say, ten meters. Achilles will never overtake the turco, turtle, argues Zeno, because by the time he covers these ten meters, The turtle has already moved on by the time, by a meter, say, and then by the time Achilles covers this additional meter, the turtle has moved on again and so on. And so it never, it can never overtake the turtle. Uh, please note that, uh, and of course, uh, the usual explanation is that it's an infinite series which you have to sum up, the time intervals, and an infinite sum can have, an infinite sum can be finite and therefore, therefore Achilles can overtake uh, the, the turtle. Uh, it's interesting to note that both the uh, paradox itself and this explanation assumes continuous time. If the time is discrete, the paradox 
would be different and the explanation for it would be different. However, I'm, I'm not a philosopher, so I, I will not uh, go on in, uh, in this direction. And just let me mention that even today in physics, there are big discussions about uh, the discrete or continuous nature of, of the world. Uh, we now know that the matter is discrete, uh, quantized, consists of quantums or quarks, and space-time is usually assumed to be continuous, but uh, I actually personally have some doubts about uh, the, the, the meaning of that. So uh, if a photon, what does it mean that a photon is halfway between two interactions with other particles? I, I don't see any meaning of this statement, so there is no halfway there. But that's my uh, own, obviously, discrete mathematician bias. Um, but I will not go into the physics issue here uh, because I'm not a physicist. I would like to talk about the connection between these two sides of mathematics. One is discrete mathematics and the other one is continuous mathematics. And of course, uh, if you think about it, the two are quite different from a mathematical point of view as well. So in uh, continuous mathematics, if you look at the basic tools, they are continuous functions, uh, limits, derivatives, uh, integrals, differential equations, and so on. In discrete mathematics, these are the, oh, tools, the basic tools are all different. They are like uh, induction, enumeration, uh, uh, inclusion, exclusion, and similar things. So, so what is the connection between the two? Uh, are, they, are they close at all? And it, I, I would like to argue that even though they are different, very different, they often try to capture the same things and they are often can be thought of as approximations of each other. Um, the approximating the continuous by discrete is of course an absolutely well-known uh, tool because you can only do numerical computations with a computer which works discreetly. And uh, so for example, in three-dimensional graphics, you use this kind of discrete approximation, uh, but also in numerical analysis, uh, in, in uh, image processing, you, you, you decompose the image into pixels and if you want to do non-applied, uh, you want to have a non-applied example, algebraic topology uh, approximates uh, continuous spaces with uh, discrete objects like simplicial complexes. So this is all about approximating the continuous by discrete. Does it, how does it go the other way around? Uh, can you approximate discrete structures by some kind of continuous objects. And that's a little bit more difficult, but just to warm up, let me give one example. Think of an engineer who looks at a piece of metal. Now this piece of metal is in fact a discrete object. It's, it, it's, it's a network of atoms. However, if, you, if the engineer wants to do some computation with this, with this piece of metal, he will not or she will not uh, uh, write up, uh, let's say, Newton's equations or even you know, uh, uh, quantum physics equations for each atom and solve this humongous system of equations that you get this way, but instead thinks of it as a single continuous material which, which uh, and then you can define fun functions on them, density, temperature, and so on, and, and then you, you get differential equations for these densities. 
Well, you can go back and forth. I mean, there is Boltzmann and all this uh, beautiful work, but, but the, the idea is that this, uh, uh, that, that, to, to, that, that an example of a continuous approximation of a discrete object, which is absolutely necessary for, for, for being able to do anything with it. Uh, by the way, I was really pleased to to hear uh, Professor Tobias uh, uh, mentioning that Felix Klein was sort of devoted in this in the introductory piece of uh, uh, paper. In it, paper. Uh, he was absolutely devoted to, to the unity of mathematics and was very happy that it, it was happening. I am also very happening that this very, very pleased that this is happening now, even in these days. And uh, uh, so let me, let me turn to, to this side of the issue. Let me start with a, an absolutely discrete problem, and that's the matching problem. And I will come to linear programming uh, that's behind it. The matching problem is the following. We have a graph. Uh, a graph is just consists of some, some nodes and some edges that connect these nodes. It's a finite object. And uh, 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 we would like to find the disjoint edges as many as possible. So in the first uh, picture here, the uh, red edges cover all the nodes. So obviously, this red set of edges uh, is is the best possible you can do. In the second example, uh, if you look at it, I mean, there could be five such edges, but I have only four red edges. But in fact, this is the best possible you can do. You have to stare it, at it for a while, and eventually you will discover the reason why you cannot have five. Um, You have to look at the three nodes on the left, which only have so the bottom one, one above and the top, and there are three nodes which have only those the same two neighbors. So there's no way to 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 cover these nodes by all of them. So you have to miss one. Okay, now the matching problem is a discrete problem, and it's a very well solved problem for this kind of graphs that you see on the right, which is called bipartite graphs, where you have two kinds of nodes. Uh, it was solved by several people, but uh, more in this form by Koenig and Agarwari in 1931. And then for the more general case, where you can split the points this way, like the one on the left-hand side, it was solved by Tat in 1947, and uh, then in a giving a, 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 a sort of a theoretical necessary and sufficient condition, and by Edmonds in 1965, who gave an efficient algorithm to compute the, the, the largest matching, the largest set of pairwise disjoint edges. Um, So what's the approach of linear programming? That's already beginning to be, uh, to move into continuous mathematics since we are looking at, uh, at uh, real numbers now instead of just uh, discrete objects. But still, I, so let's, M is this set of edges and let uh, Xij be one if the edge Ij, that's the edge connecting nodes I and J is in M and let it be zero if ij is not in m. So this is kind of the indicator vector of, uh, of this matching m. Then it must satisfy the following uh, conditions. So xi is uh, either zero or one. And if you sum all the xi j's, fix i and sum over all j's, then the sum will be at most one because you cannot have two edges going into the same point by the definition of matchings. So you get this inequality. And that's 
inequality has to hold for every node i. And now you want to maximize the sum of all the entries xij, all these variables and xij, because this sum just counts the total number of edges. So it's a one, it adds a one for each edge. Um, now this is not yet a linear program because of the first condition that xij must be in zero or one. But let's throw this out and replace it by say zero less than or equal to xij less than or equal to one. So you replace uh, uh, this condition by a couple of inequalities. Actually the upper bound is irrelevant that's implied by the others, but uh, the lower bound is important. So this is now a linear program uh, because it's linear inequalities and some linear uh, function you want to maximize subject to these linear inequalities. Um, but we have changed the problem. Uh, with, with xij equals zero or one, it actually certainly gives the maximum uh, size of a matching, but with this modified program, it's called the relaxation of the pro problem. It, it might change the optimum. And in fact, if you say this, this, this very, take this very, very simple graph, then uh, here is the system of uh, linear inequalities specialized to this graph, but uh, not, not a very complicated system. Um, sum of any two variables is at most one. So there's a variable for each edge, uh, non-negative. Sum of any two variables is at most one. And you want to maximize the sum of all variables. And uh, it turns out that the optimal solution is uh, given by setting all variables to be one half. And that gives three halves and not one. So we, 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 we lose here. So by, by uh, replacing the zero one condition by an inequality, uh, we spoil the problem. Um, and so the question is, uh, does it, uh, how, how to fix that? So this means geometrically that if you look at these vectors, uh, then, then this polyhedron that, that is defined by these inequalities here will have a vertex, namely one half, one half, one half, which is not integral. And that's bad for us, so we want to improve that. Um, cut this off by some appropriate further inequality. Uh, so that's the problem. And this was solved in a beautiful way by Jack Edmonds in 1965. He, he found those inequalities that you have to add in order to eliminate this kind of bad non-integral vertices. In other words, if you look at this system of linear inequalities, I, I don't, so, so this last one, which is a family of inequalities, so you says that if you pick an odd number of vertices and you count how many edges are inside this set, that the, the sum on the left counts these, the, these edges, then uh, you have at most half, because each of them takes up half, but the half is not integral, and, and the left-hand side is integral, so you can subtract one half on the right-hand side, and this way you get a stricter inequality, and these are all that are needed. Um, I, I, I couldn't resist telling you this example, because this really opened up a, a, a huge, big, uh, uh, new approach to, to this kind of combinatorial problems and uh, which led among others to this amazing development in connection with the traveling salesman problem uh, which is rather well known and uh, in the, when I was young it was said that 50 cities is the maximum for which the traveling salesman problem can be solved because it has 50 factorial possible solutions, and that's already too big for any computer to ever handle. 
But now they routinely solve several thousand cities, but uh, of course not by looking at all possible solutions, but by, by uh, ac actually by methods based on Edmonds's work. But this is still uh, it's still a rather combinatorial fact, even though there are linear inequalities here. So let's go on. And I come now to an extension of linear programming. Uh, it's called semi-definite programming. And I would like to illustrate it on the example of the stable set problem. Uh, the stable set problem is very similar to the matching problem. The matching problem, we wanted to pick as many disjoint edges as possible. Here we want to pick as many non-adjacent points, points not connected by an edge as possible. Uh, so pairwise, non-adjacent. So on the, right, on the graph on the right hand side, the, the four red nodes are such that there's no edge between them. So they are stable in this uh, usual terminology. And uh, well, you can argue that this is a maximum that you can achieve. But the, the stable, the, this problem, as opposed to the matching problem, is NP-hard, which means that there is no hope to obtain a polynomial time algorithm, and there is no hope to obtain a decent, necessary, and sufficient condition for the existence of, of a certain number of uh, stable, uh, a certain size of a stable set. Um, so here is this, uh, we, we can translate it to a linear system of linear inequalities as before, but uh, if you drop the integrality condition, you spoil it too much to be useful. And the next idea is maybe let's drop linearity. Uh, so the condition that xi is zero or one, which is the, the bad condition, uh, can be replaced by xi squared equals xi, because this equation has only two solutions, zero or one. And in fact, the, the second condition, xi plus xj less than or equal to one, can be replaced. That's not necessary, but it's a little bit nicer, simpler condition, xi times xj is zero, because if you have, for every edge, ij, because if you have an edge, one of the endpoints, you cannot have both endpoints in the set, so one of them must be zero, and so the product must be zero. And uh, in this case, you look at the maximum, you maximize the sum of the xi's, equivalent to the sum of the xi squared, and uh, the maximum is alpha of g, and that's, that's because you go back, and that's exactly the same thing as before. So you get a zero one solution, and the second condition says that the ones must correspond to a stable set. So this is uh, uh, an idea. The problem is, of course, that uh, so, I mean that follows that solving such a system, such a very simple system of quadratic equations, is already NP-hard, because uh, because this is an NP-hard problem. Now we do some little tricks. We can homogenize, uh, introducing a new variable x0, setting it to one, and then the first equation will be homogeneous, degree two. And then we can linearize the whole thing by uh, introducing new variables for the quadratic terms. Again, well-known trick in uh, many areas of uh, mathematics. And uh, in this case, these are naturally form a matrix Y, these products, X, I, J. So what are the properties of this matrix Y? Um, y is, oops, I, I was afraid of that. So the plus minus is, should be a curly greater than or equal to, and it means that it's positive semi-definite. So this, my, this matrix Y is positive semi-definite. Uh, 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 that's uh, because it's a different laptop than <laughs> what I wrote. Think now. The rank of y is, is one, uh, clearly, and uh, some entries are given. 
the, of course, the interesting set is that uh, certain entries corresponding to edges are set, so positions which correspond to edges are set to zero. Uh, y zero zero first upper first entry is one, and uh, the, the second equation translates into y uh, y index i i equals y index i zero. So two entries are equal. Every diagonal entry is equal to the corresponding entry in the first row. Very, very simple system of uh, linear equations. And alpha of g is still equal to the maximum of the trace of y because you can sort of reverse this and decompose such a y into the, this product of two vectors. But this rank of y equals one is a, is, is, is a nasty condition. Uh, the first condition is fine. Positive semi-definiteness is a convex condition. So it com defines a convex set, and we are uh, trying to, uh, to maximize over it, and that, that, that's a nice problem. Maximize some linear, linear function over that. But the second one we want to get rid of, and let's just toss it out, and that, that then we get a modified uh, version, uh, which is uh, I uh, denote by theta of g. Now, so this is a relaxation that means we are now optimizing over more y's, so we get a bigger value. Uh, it's called a semi-definite relaxation, and this is an upper bound on alpha of g. And now this is surprisingly polynomial time solver, but by, well, I mean, it's not so surprising because everything is convex, so you only, you already have a good start here to, in order to solve this, and in fact, that works. Uh, not trivial, but, but it works. So you can solve this in polynomial time, and you get an upper bound on, on alpha of g. Uh, it turns out, actually, that equality holds for many classes of graphs, many well-known classes, perfect graphs, Knezer graphs, and, and others, but I will not, I don't want to go into graph theory. Uh, uh, um, let me mention one thing, sorry. Some, uh, yeah, so here is this system of equations, and again, the plus minus means is a greater, no, should be a, curly greater than or equal to sign, so, so y is positive semi-definite. Now let's write y, it's a positive semi-definite matrix, we can always write it as a gram matrix, and uh, this square <laughs> denotes the set of real numbers. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, um, I thought but I only use standard uh, letters, but apparently not always. And um, then these VIs satisfy the following conditions. First of all, two of these vectors VI, if IJ is an edge, then their inner product is zero, so they are orthogonal. So we assign vectors to the vertices, adjacent vertices get uh, orthogonal vectors, and then there are some uh, further conditions which are not uh, just translations of the previous ones. Um, and uh, so here we get uh, to this, such a, an assignment where orthogonal vectors must be assigned to adjacent vertices is called an orthogonal representation of the graph. And it has many nice properties, and, and it's an interesting uh, object. But I would like to only show you one, uh, which actually leads out of, oh, well, this is just uh, an example of how to represent, say, the pentagon by in such a way. So to each vertex, you assign the vector. So you take this, uh, this uh, pyramid, and uh, to each vertex, you, you, uh, you, you, you assign the vector pointing to that vertex from the, the apex, 
and you have to open it sufficiently well exactly so that the uh, non-neighboring uh, uh, edges are uh, orthogonal. That's, that's what it is. Anyway, um, so here is what I would like to show you is to relate the stable set problem to quantum physics. I'll show you this. Thing. Now in uh, physics, uh, you, quantum physics, you, you work with vectors in a Hilbert space. So a state of a physical system is a vector in a Hilbert space. And the measurement is a self-adjoint linear operator. And if you want to, event, uh, to, to observe a particular event, you know, whether the uh, a spin of an electron points up or down or something like that, then you do a projection onto a subspace of this Hilbert space. And uh, then if you observe it, then it, it, it's a, you get a probability distribution and the probability that the event actually happens or you observe it to happen is the squared length of this projection. And two events can be observed simultaneously if they are orthogonal to each other. So this all has the flavor of these repre orthogonal representations that I, uh, I uh, derived from the semi-definite optimization before. So does it really have a connection with orthogonal representations or it just also talks about vectors and orthogonal vectors? So let's look at, uh, the, the answer is yes, and this was worked out by uh, a number of, uh, these are mathematical physicists, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, I will just report about one of these results. So here is, uh, a problem in quantum physics. So it is some small system on the left, some kind of physical system, and suppose you have n possible events. Uh, each event you can observe through a little window or by some method, uh, but uh, you only one can, you can only observe one of them. And then you can of course repeat the experiment and maybe of, of uh, observe another one. Now, these are events, so the, they are, they either, when you observe them, you either see them happening or see them not happening. And I, I will denote by the black dots those which you observe happening. But of course, you don't observe all of them. Uh, oh, one more thing is that uh, these events cannot be observed Certain events cannot be observed, cannot occur simultaneously. And uh, don't think of anything fancy uh, quantum physics here. Uh, they are simply logically impossible. So an event that, say, two <laughs> electrons spins are uh, pointing in both up, and the event that one points up and one points down, they cannot happen simultaneously. They are logically contradicting each other. So this kind of, if, if there is such a pair, I, I put an edge between those. Um, but actually, all I can do is observe one of them. But I can repeat it and observe one of them and say pick uh, the one which I want to observe is uh, uh, I, I choose randomly one of these windows and look in and, and I observe whether that event happened or not. And the question is how often do we see black? So I, this is again the credits to these guys. So this leads us to something which is called generalized Bell inequalities. Bell inequalities are well known in, in uh, quantum physics. Uh, this is some general way of looking at them. So what's the probability that you see a black point? Well, um, th there is this graph. This graph has a certain alpha. A cer alpha is the maximum size of a stable set. 
Now you can argue that if an edge means that those two events cannot happen simultaneously, then all the events which happen will form a stable set in this graph. So there are at most alpha of them, and you have a chance of at most alpha over n of actually picking one of them and looking at one of them. So if you repeat this experiment, you will see uh, at most a fraction of alpha g over n black dots. But this is, assumes that it makes sense to talk about what events which, the set of events which actually occur without actually looking them up. Just sort of theoretically, I, I, I think there is this set of events there. And in fact, if you think about it, this assumes something which is, uh, was uh, an issue, uh, an important issue in, in uh, quantum physics, whether hidden parameters exist. So the, the idea is that uh, in order to, to assume that something happens without observing it, you have to assume that this makes sense. So, there is, so this one, if you observe it later, say that there's some set of hidden parameters that determine whether this event occurs or not, even though you don't look it up. Now, if you do uh, more careful computations with quantum physics, you get a weaker inequality. You get the inequality that the probability of seeing black is at most theta of g over n, where theta is this uh, semi-definite relaxation of alpha. And uh, so if you want to, say, disprove the theory of hidden parameters, you do this experiment and maybe you find that you see black more often than alpha g over n, and that disproves the theory of hidden parameters. If you see black more often than theta, g over n, uh, theta of g over n, then this proves quantum physics. Uh, we don't expect the second one, but people have tried to do the first one, and uh, uh, for this we need a graph with alpha g less than theta of g, because alpha g is equal. I told you that for many graphs they are equal, and then, you, then these two bounds are the same. So you, have, you need one where theta g is less than alpha of g. And uh, here are two, of such, two such graphs. Actually, both of them were used in, by physicists for this purpose. Uh, but the Wagner graph, the eight-node graph, uh, is uh, easier to realize uh, in, uh, by some physical system because it has eight nodes, so you see that it's, it corresponds to certain spins up or down, up or down. I, I won't, uh, won't formulate it exactly, but that's, that's the way you interpret this, these uh, points. And so uh, this is the this was done, this uh, experiment was done by three independent groups in, 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 I think, both, all three of them in 2015. Here is uh, some picture that the first group uh, explained there. What they did is that they created a, a so-called entangled pair, EPR pair of, of, I think, protons, which they took them more than a kilometer apart and they did measurements on them. And uh, so here are the numerical results. If you wanted to, if, if hidden parameters exist, then, then they would have been successful or seeing a black in, uh, in at most uh, three-eighths of the cases. That's 0.375. If quantum physics, uh, using quantum physics, you get an upper bound of 0.427, and their experiment gives point, 0 0.401. So this disproves hidden parameters, at least as far as I understand this, uh, 
business, and of course doesn't disprove quantum physics. Uh, and it's well above the, the lower bound. In fact, it's, if you look at carefully, it's almost exactly or perhaps exactly halfway between the two. I don't know any explanation for that. This is some, some strange phenomenon, uh, probably a coincidence, but uh, it, it's nice. Uh, I think I have some time uh, left. So uh, let me talk about a, a, key, a, a, a way to force actually uh, so, um, oh, uh, Facebook. It's okay, great. <laughs> it's exactly what. So, um, let me talk about graph limits. That's really a way of forcing, uh, so sort of forcefully make uh, make this connection. Not not in the way as it happened before. So, first, I would like to explain some, my pictures, which I will show because. Uh, so this, on the left, you see a usual way of representing a graph. Uh, and I have to tell you that if you have more than 20 nodes, then, then looking at such a picture doesn't tell you much. Uh, to a computer, this, uh, you, you usually input a graph in the form of a matrix. Uh, but looking at the matrix tells you even less. But uh, there's a little trick here which I would like to, to do is replace in the matrix the zeros by white squares and the ones by black squares. And in that case, you get this kind of, of bad chessboard or strange chessboard or crossword puzzle type picture. And that represents the same graph, so it's just uh, another way of uh, representing it. But I would like to view this as a uh, function, the, the whole thing, the, the whole area as the unit square in the plane, and each square, uh, and on each square there's a function where the value of the function each square is one if it's black, and little square is one if it's black, and zero if it's white. So that's a, that's a function which happens to have values be zero or one defined on the unit square. Let me see how, how the, the certain graphs look like in this representation. This is what I sh I'm showing is uh, one of the random graphs. This is a huge big area of graph theory, the theory of random graphs. Uh, but the definition is very simple. For each pair of nodes, you flip a coin, and depending on the coin flip, you either connect them or not. It's the simplest possible random uh, way of defining a random graph. There are many other models. And uh, so this is how it looks like. Now, this is on 100 nodes. If you increase the number of nodes to would if I would increase the num hundred number of nodes to, say, uh, instead of 100 to 1,000, then probably you would just see uniform gray, because of course this. And uh, in fact, gray with, with, uh, with sort of intensity one half, so halfway between black and white. Um, OK. Here is. Another example, or this has 200 nodes. It's a random, I call it a random Legron uniform attachment graph. It's not really that important how it's constructed. It's a, it's a graph where you add, add a node and then you throw in all edges to make the edge density, so the number of edges exactly half of all possible, or about approximately half, and then you throw in a new node and you again throw in sufficiently many new edges. And if you repeat this 200 times, you get this picture. Of course, the nodes which were uh, thrown in uh, early, they uh, get many more edges between them than this happens late, then later. Um, now again, going up to, to 1,000, you would get a picture like you see on uh, the 
right-hand side. And I would like to consider this as a sort of a grayscale representation of a two-variable function, the value on, uh, so a function on the unit square. And it turns out that uh, this picture will be uh, the gray, will tend to the grayscale representation of the function one minus the maximum of x and y. So on the upper left, corner you get all blacks because x and y are small. I, 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 I consider, yeah, this is like a, I, I would like to consider this some kind of adjacency matrix, so the origin is in the upper left corner. And so the small values are in the upper left corner, so, so that's the function values are close to one. So I, I, I I have time to show you these two pictures, but, uh, but uh, you can imagine that there are, you can have other sequences of graphs uh, that uh, if, they, if you increase the number more and more, then eventually you will see some kind of uh, grayscale image of some kind of function. And this is actually uh, what uh, gives the idea of graph limits. At least this is the case for limits of dense graphs, and that's a well-developed theory which uh, uh, we at uh, Microsoft Research have uh, developed. Uh, uh, Christian Borgs, Jennifer Chase, with Vera Shosh, Balash Szegedi, and Kati Westheim on B. And there is an uh, important facts about this uh, Limit objects, I will show, can be defined. Uh, convergence can be exactly defined, and uh, both in a local and global sense. So it's a nice, well-developed theory. There is another theory. Uh, it's about bounded degree graphs. It was developed uh, two offices down in the same Microsoft research group by Itai Benjamini and Odette Schramm, and we only knew about each other once the two theories were developed. And that's a deep but incomplete theory uh, because there are different possible reasonable notions of uh, convergence. There are different possible notions of limit objects, and there are still deep unsolved problems uh, uh, including uh, the so-called sophisticity problem in group theory, which I will not uh, uh, tell you, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a really fundamental problem in group theory. Uh, it's related to this. So this was developed about 20 years ago, and uh, uh, we tried to fill in the gap. And recently, I think we have some some results, finally. Uh, uh, but this is still work in progress, and I will not be able to, to talk about this. It, uh, uh, so these are graphs which are neither dense. So dense means number of edges proportional to n squared for an n-node graph. Uh, bounded degree means that implies that the number of edges is linear in the number of nodes. And in between, the number of edges can be n log n or n to the three halves and, and something like that. And these are all uh, quite difficult issues, but I, I, something is going on there, but I will, uh, I will not talk about this. I would like to just give you a glimpse of the dense graph theory. Um, and now I have to be a little bit more technical, I'll give, give you some, actually write some formulas which probably will miss some characters here and there, but that seems to be the, the fate of this talk. So the limit object, so these dense graph sequences are called graphons, and they are simply uh, defined as a measurable symmetric function W on the unit square with values between zero and one. I mean, these are these grayscale images that I have shown you, and if you 
every function between zero and one, you can at least imagine this grayscale image, of course, uh, grayscale image. And uh, so these are called graphons. Now, we suppose we have a finite graph F and we have a G. Now think of G as a very big finite graph and F as a small finite graph. And we are interested in the density of F in G. And uh, one way to define it is the probability that if you randomly map the nodes of F into G, then this map will preserve edges. This map may or may not preserve edges. And there is a certain probability that it does, and that's the density of F in G. So for example, the triangle density, you map the three points, and then you either see a triangle there or not, and the probability that you see a triangle there in the big graph G is, uh, and is this density, and this is de uh, denoted by T of F and G. So that's formally, it means that you look at the number of homomorphisms of F into G and divide by the total number of maps into G. Now, we only also need to define this for the limit object, which should be an approximation of G. This is this grayscale image. And it can be defined as this integral, which is, looks a little bit frightening. So F is a finite graph again. W is a function on the unit square. And uh, the way you define it is that you assign a variable. Here, you see there is, can you see this pointer? Uh, does the pointer work? Yeah, OK, great. So here you see this. Uh, that you assign a variable to each node of f, x, xi. And uh, now then for every edge, you evaluate the function w, xi, xj, and you take the product of these. So if there is no edge at all between them, so when this w is 0 for any pair, then this product is 0, so then, then that's what this formula wants to capture. And you integrate this over all possible axes. OK, so this is, the, this is the, the, the density in the limit object. Now we say that the sequence of graphs is convergent if for every fixed, quote unquote, a small graph f, the density of f in g1, density of f in g2, and so on, is a convergent sequence. It's a numerical sequence, so it's convergent in the usual sense. And we say that, that the sequence GN converges to a graph on W if this sequence is convergent and its limit is given by the density of F in W. So for an Erdős-Rényi random graph, Remember, every pair of edges is connected with probability one half independently. We flip a new coin for every pair. Um, if you look at a particular F, then at least if G is large enough so we can ignore the uh, degeneracies, so you, you pick, pick, pick an image for the vertex set of F then you have a probability of a half to see any particular edge there. So eventually you get one half to the number of edges. And that's the same as the previous integral. And so in this case, we, it's a simple computation that shows that erdős rényi random graphs, we had a picture for that, converges to the identically one half function. And uh, now, just uh, so, sort of the, the key uh, facts about this. If the graph sequence is convergent, so if for every f the, uh, the uh, densities in these GNs, uh, f in these GNs com form a convergent sequence, then there is a graphon to which it converges. So the, limit, the graphons are sufficient to represent all limits. The next statement is that every graphon 
is the limit of the sequence. This is a little bit surprising because these are this is a sequence of finite graphs. So you would expect that the limit would be some something special, like maybe piecewise linear functions or or uh, continuous functions or, 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 or some decent functions, not all measurable functions. All measurable functions are too many. But no, every measurable function is a limit. Now you can say, okay, but this is cheating because maybe the same convergent sequence also converges to a simple measurable, to a simpler measurable function. But it turns out that it's essentially, the limit is essentially unique up to some measure preserving transformations, which is a technicality I don't, don't, don't want to, to explain now. So we really need all these graphons uh, to represent the limits. And in fact, you can define a very nice metric distance of two graphons and with this distance, they will form a compact matrix space, which is a, turns out to be a, a very important fact, as I will show you in a minute. So what are these graph limits good for? I mean, I started with saying that they are approximations of finite graphs, but what is this good for? OK, they are approximations. Uh, Compactness will imply existence of optima, and that uh, I will illustrate this to you. And uh, they can also, uh, they are also very useful in a lot more technical issues and uh, non-trivial issues in extreme graph theory, uh, because they sort of represent the templates of the optimal solutions. Uh, I'll say a few words about that. Uh, they are also used in uh, large deviation theory from random graphs. They, they lead to a local version of extreme graph theory, and there are other ap uh, applications that I don't want to talk about. Right? Well, we will not have time to talk about that. So uh, this, is, this slide shows the idea of how this is a useful as an approximation of finite graphs. So do you, you want to approximate large finite graph by this infinite object. So let's ask ourselves, how many triangles is there in this graph? Well, I don't expect you to, to give an answer to this. Uh, if you want to, well, first of all, it's a, that's a random variable because on the left, this graph is a random graph, so it's a random variable. If you want to compute, say, the expectation, yeah, it's, a, it's a somewhat nasty combinatorial problem, a recurrence, that, uh, because you have to follow the definition, you, you get to a recurrence, which you can do, but it will be uh, uh, unpleasant, a lot of computation. But if we know that this graph on the left is approximated in appropriate sense by, by the graph on the right, uh, and sorry, that should be the density of K3 in W, not in G. Sorry for the misprint. Then this can be defined by this integral. Well, this is uh, what we, how we define density, and it's it's still not a terribly pleasant thing to evaluate this integral, but uh, it's a first-year calculus exercise. So, so we know approximately the number of triangles from this approximation. Okay, what about existence of optima? So here is a classical optimization, very simple optimization problem. Minimize the function x cubed minus 6x over x greater than or equal to zero. Uh, probably many of you have uh, uh, done the derivation in head and, and you see that the optimum is attained at square root of two. So this minimum, uh, this minimum down here is at square root of two. So if you are going back to Zeno, if you are a Greek philosopher who doesn't say Pythagorean, and you don't believe in, uh, in uh, irrational numbers, then you have to say that 
the, this does not have a minimum, this does not attain a minimum. At least not in rational, so uh, that's why real numbers are useful. So real numbers are useful because you have an optimum, you can talk about an optimum solution of this. Okay, let's look at a discrete, optimiza a, a discrete optimization problem. Suppose you have a graph with edge density a half, and let's look at the density of four cycles in that. Well, that can be different, de depends on the graph, uh, but uh, which graph minimizes this density? So it's an optimization problem quite similar to the usual optimization problems like for the one on the previous slide, except that we are optimizing not over numbers, but over graphs. The answer to this problem is sort of not trivial, not terribly difficult. The answer is that this number is always larger than one, six, one over 16, and it can get arbitrarily close to this for, for example, for a random graph with edge density a half. So for a random graph with edge density a half, if you map the four points, four edges have to be there, that's one half to the fourth is the probability that it's there. But it's only approximate because there are those cases when the points uh, coincide, and so that's why you always get strictly like them on six. So you can say that this, for this optimization problem, uh, the optimum is not attained among graphs. And in fact, it, it's a little bit more difficult to prove, but not very hard either, is that if you allow graphons, you can ask the same question about not only graphs, about graphons, everything is defined here. Uh, the minimum is attained for this constant one half, graph, our first gray scale example only. So the minimum is not a, a, attain them on graphs, so analogously to the previous slide, this leads to the conclusion that graph limits are useful. Okay, let's go back to this fact that the minimum is attained for the constant one-half graph on only. Another way of saying this is that if you have a graph on with edge density a half, and uh, four cycle density one sixteenth, then these two facts uniquely determine this, this graphon. Are there any other graphons that are determined by a finite number of, uh, of densities? So if I tell you the number of triangles or number of four cycles, then this uniquely determines this graphon. So the formal definition is that uh, graph on W is finitely forcible. If you have any other graph on which has the same uh, densities, and if there is a finite set of uh, finite graphs, so that if another graph on agrees the den in the densities of these finite graphs with, with our W, then it's essentially W up to some measure preserving transformations of the of the, the variables. Okay, so then it's only called finitely forcible. And uh, there is a, these seem to be the templates for optimal graphs in extremal graph theory. An example is the previous uh, question that what is the minimum number of four cycles given the density of uh, edges? A minimum density of four cycles. That's an extremal graph theory problem. And the extremal case is uh, random graphs asymptotically. And so the template for random graph is, is the identically one half function, so the grayscale half with half intensity. Um, actually, we thought for a while that this is a stricter relation. But, uh, 
but uh, it's a group of people, I, I will come to that, they, they disprove this conjecture. So this is not completely true what I have here. But as a, it's still a good, uh, good uh, guide to what, uh, what, temp what kind of templates to look for if you have a, a, a problem in extremal graph theory. So here are some uh, examples of uh, finitely forcible graphs. Uh, a constant function was the one that I quoted. But, uh, it's, a, it's a result of Chung, Graham, and Wilson that these are finitely forcible by the four cycle density and the edge density. Uh, with Vera Schorsch, then we extended this to step functions uh, in the sense that the steps are rectangles. So they are constant on a finite number of rectangles. And for a while we thought that this should be all because this would be very nice. But then, uh, then with Balar Segedi we found uh, some other examples. A couple of them are shown here. And uh, so these are all finitely forcible. But we could prove that not everything is finitely forcible. Finitely forceable graphons form a bare one category set, a meager set, in this compact set of all limit objects, all graphons. So, it's, so, so it's, it does not uh, contain all of them. And in fact, are easy to, there are some easy examples. For example, any polynomial, any function that's given by a polynomial is not finitely forcible. That was actually a surprising result because we saw that these are, if anything, then constant function, but the next one would be linear function. Maybe they can be also finitely forced, but that's not the case. Uh, in fact, the only linear function that can be finitely forced is the constant function. And uh, so finitely forcible functions are, are sort of a nice uh, set, a, a small, a meager set. And we formulated with Balazs Szegedi a number of conjectures about them which would imply all sorts of beautiful stuff in graph theory. But then uh, came Dan Kral and this group of his young collaborators, and they uh, disproved all the conjectures we had. <laughs> uh, uh, and maybe I would like to show you just one of these uh, uh, disproved results, which is a beautiful positive result in itself. So here is an arbitrary graphon. You, you may think this is a cat, but that's actually the grayscale image of a graphon. Uh, so you take an arbitrary graphon, and then they construct some kind of way of embedding it in a, you know, as a upper left corner of, uh, maybe twice that large uh, square, and then put some stuff, this, uh, this thing here is just uh, some appropriate uh, function, which I will not uh, formulate. And this extended graph one is finitely forcible. And not only finitely forcible, it's forcible by a fixed number of fixed, by a fixed set of finite graphs, independently of the image that you want to force. Uh, maybe 100 finite graphs, or maybe 2,000, but some, some fixed finite set of graphs. And this is really amazing because what it says is that, well, there is this fixed set of finite graphs. What is, very, what is varying are the densities of these finite graphs in this graph form. So you give these 100 real numbers and they encode the picture on the left. This is a very surprising thing because they find that they force this, uh, this graph form and uh, this is uniquely determined by them. Uh, so this is, a, I think it's a beautiful, 
result which started out as a negative result, but I think you can turn it into a positive result and then it's even more interesting. And uh, before anyone asks, L.M. Lovas is my son and uh, he was criticized heavily for disproving conjectures of his father. <laughs> I forgave him. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your attention.